So again, today the webinar is entitled Risk and Protective Factors. Risk and Protective Factors for Elder Abuse in Canada, Findings from the CLSA, and it will be present, presented by Dr. David Burns. Uh, Dr. David Burns is a professor at the University of Toronto in the Factor Inventosh uh, Faculty of Social Work. He holds a Canada Research Chair in Older Adult Mistreatment Prevention. Uh, he completed a PhD at Columbia University School of Social Work, concentrating in gerontology and advanced practice. Uh, Dr. Burns' program of research focuses on elder mistreatment, including the development of basic knowledge and the design, evaluation, and measurement of interventions to prevent and respond to elder mistreatment. He advises major international organizations on elder mistreatment, such as the World Health Organization and National Institutes of Health, as well as federal and regional governments in Canada and the United States. Dr. Burns also works with nonprofit organizations, uh, such as state level adult protective service programs, um, and he does this on the development, implementation, and measurement of uh, elder mistreatment response and prevention programs. So I think we have a very exciting and experienced presenter for us today and a very uh, important topic. So I will now turn it over to you, Dr. Burns. All right, thank you. Okay, so uh, thanks for everyone for joining today. Um, I'm going to do this presentation and leave some time at the end if you have any questions or comments and uh, certainly welcome that. Um, and um, before I start, I do want to uh, acknowledge uh, a couple of uh, entities here. First of all, the CLSA, thank you, thank you for the invitation here. Uh, I also want to, um, you know, thank you and acknowledge uh, access to this data. Uh, it's it's a wonderful resource that we have here in Canada for those of us who are um, studying aging issues across all sorts of domains. And um, so, um, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, also wanna uh, acknowledge uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada for your support and uh, ongoing uh, work with you, uh, most recently with, uh, with uh, Megan and Aes and, and Aaron. Um, just so everyone knows, there is a full report uh, that is forthcoming uh, in the near future that will be uh, posted on the, uh, uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada website, uh, and that will have more details than I'm able to uh, share here today. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, but I, you know, I, I assume that most people out there uh, joining today are are aware of you know the aging population in Canada. But in the event that there are some of you who are kind of joining our our group for the first time, just a a couple of slides, basic kind of background. So this sort of demonstrates the 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 structure and the shape of of, of the shifting population aging, and so we see that. You know, from the early 1970s up until the projected 2030, uh, the the shape of our, our 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 or the structure of our population population as it relates to age is changing from you know the majority of the population being younger towards more of a rectangular shape. There, um, you can post this in the chat. But any any uh, any reasons? What why, why is this happening? What what are the major reasons this is happening? Like ex life expectancy, better better healthcare, low birth rate. Okay, and so we see that this, you know, these trends are certainly happening across uh, the country, um, and uh, this gives a nice representation here, again, with uh, from early 1970s, projected towards 2080, the proportion of the Canadian population who are older adults, uh, you can see, like, that, that right now we are right in the middle of the steepest kind of uh, change in, in rate here, um, and where I live here in, in Ontario, um, just kind of bringing it a bit more locally, you know, we, we've just recently gone through really what's what's a quite a remarkable uh, time in our history. Um, so this this gray line here represents the proportion of the population in Ontario who are children between the ages of zero to 14. And this uh, this blue um uh line represents those who are older adults and for the first time in the history of our province the proportion of the population who are age 65 or older crossed that um who, uh, the proportion that were, that were children back in was it 2016 so 
again, for those of you who aren't in our kind of um, aging kind of circles here, um, you know, just to kind of emphasize, we're, we're going through a really important time in our in our history. Um, and so what does this mean for the for the issue of, of elder abuse that I'm going to talk about today? So at any by the way, anytime you see EA that refers to elder abuse, and the, the term elder abuse is often used interchangeably with terms such as elder mistreatment or elder maltreatment. Uh, but what does this population aging mean for the issue of elder abuse? So it means that in the absence of developing uh, effective prevention strategies, the absolute scope or the absolute numbers of elder abuse cases out there will expand, will grow in proportion with um, the, the older adult population growth. Um, and unfortunately, um, this, our, our, you know, our knowledge of effective prevention strategies represents the largest gap in our field. Um, and so that's really what motivates what we're talking about here today. Um, prevention development um, is predicated in part, I would say in large part, on our understanding of elder abuse risk and protective factors. So in order to develop targeted, mechanistically driven prevention interventions, we need to know uh, what are those factors that are increasing or decreasing the probability or likelihood of older adults becoming victims of elder mistreatment. Um, and this applies to all kind of levels of prevention. So whether we're talking about primary, secondary, or tertiary. So um, to develop kind of larger population public education and awareness campaigns or to develop educational and training materials, we need to know about risk and protective factors. Same thing with, you know, screening tools that may be used, for example, in primary care office settings or emergency departments, for example, um, we need to know like what, what are those factors that place older adults at risk. And then certainly, and this is sort of the area where I spend a lot of my time is when we develop interventions that respond to actual cases of, you know, existing cases of elder abuse out in the community, we need to know what are those um, factors that we should be targeting to kind of reduce an older adult's risk of re-victimization. Um, so just so we're all on the same page, how, how do we define the issue of elder abuse? So it's it's an intentional act or failure to act by a caregiver or another person in a relationship involving an expectation of trust that causes or creates a risk of harm to an older adult. So there's a lot there, but essentially, um, you know, it does occur in, in relationships involving an expectation of trust. So it, it does not include, for example, you know, scams or frauds that may be perpetrated by somebody in a different country who's unknown to the older adult. It doesn't include the issue of identity theft, for example, where the older adult has never met the person who may be doing it. Um, and while it's a closely related issue, it doesn't formally include the issue of self-neglect because that doesn't occur in the context of a relationship. Um, while there are varying definitions out there uh, across Canada and the world, um, we almost universally accept that it does include the following subtypes. So emotional, physical, sexual, and financial abuse, as well as neglect by others. Um, you know, it, I, I think fortunately we've gotten to a point where, where, you know, people really do recognize this as a really serious problem and uh, very grateful for, you know, various levels of government um, um, really acknowledging and, and uh, um and putting it you know giving it attention uh these days um uh it certainly is a serious issue with with large consequences so we know that um you know there's there's a few studies that have followed older adults over time so so for example over a nine-year period victims of elder abuse are uh, have a higher likelihood of, of premature death compared to those who don't experience elder mistreatment and there's all sorts of physical and mental health uh uh, sequelae, uh, as you can imagine, and that at, at a societal level, um, victims of elder abuse have higher rates of hospitalization, emergency room use, nursing home placement, uh, etc. Okay, so what we're talking about today is really so, so how big is this problem, and and what places older adults at risk, or you know may protect them as well. So when we talk about how big is this problem, we're, you know we we have to consider a couple of different 
um, um, concepts or, or, or rates. The, you know, one is 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 incidence, which is really the you know the rate of new cases entering the population over a certain period of time, um, and then prevalence, which is the rate of cases out there at any given time. Um, and certainly most of the research out there, um, you know, has focused more on prevalence than incidence. Um, I recently was involved in a study that looked at incidence, and I'll give you that reference at the end of this, uh, this presentation. But um, today we're focusing more on the issue of prevalence. Uh, when we think about risk and protective factors, we generally um, try to understand and analyze them through this ecological systems perspective. So we, we understand that this is um, not a problem, you know, obviously the older adult, the victim is central to this issue, um, but it does occur in the context of a relationship. And so we also, you know, in addition to understanding risk and protective factors attached to the older adult victim, we also try to understand factors that are attached to those trusted others out there who may be at risk of perpetrating elder abuse. Um, we try to understand what what goes on in the relationship between them that may place them at higher risk. And then, you know, look at the family system, the home environment, their social environment, and then social determinants of health uh, to try to really understand the full scope of risk factors uh, that place older adults vulnerable. Um, so leading up to this, this research, um, you know, there, we, we, the, the field has come a long way uh, in its understanding of risk and protective factors. For a long time, um, it did rely largely on studies using convenient samples um, drawn from, you know, health healthcare or so, social service setting, settings, which obviously have a high degree of selection bias and threats to external validity. Um, there was a period of time where where we were uh, using population-based samples, but then then using agency records to identify victims, which which also carried a lot of of, of bias. And then in the last sort of fifteen years or so, um, we've been uh, getting more into to, to actual population-based studies, uh, interviewing older adults directly, and and this has been great and carries a lot more external validity. Um, and the CLSA is one example of of this type of study. Where the CLSA helps us advance the, um, you know, the the state of the science is that it's, you know, as I'll talk about today, is that we can actually look at this somewhat longitudinally uh, over time. So here, here are the research questions um, that that were that were uh, pursued. Um, what is the one year prevalence of elder abuse in Canada? Uh, and what factors are associated with elder abuse victimization over a three-year period? Um, and this, uh, these findings have also been published in um, in this paper here, Nature Aging, uh, which you can access online. Okay, so just some some details about the CLSA methods. And please, if I uh, if any if I'm saying any of this incorrectly, uh, please feel free to jump in and, and correct me. But essentially, at baseline. Um, a random sample of over 50,000 adults aged 45 to 85 using both telephone and in-person interviews. Um, the current findings that I'm showing you today were, were based at the time on the most recent and available uh, waves of data collection, baseline and follow-up. Um, in 2018, in their first follow-up, uh, an elder abuse module was included um, uh, for the first time. And so not in 2015, but yes, in 2018, um, and it was administered to older adults who are age 65 uh, or older. Um, and, uh, and so the analytic sample for this uh, particular study included those uh, older adults who completed both baseline and follow-up interviews and were age 65 or older at the time of follow-up. Um, okay, and then it is, it is um, worth mentioning, uh, of course, that the sample is disproportionately skewed towards more of a white, um, uh, higher income and well-educated sample of older adults. Um, and we did use uh, data weighting uh, to account for sample misrepresentation um, in, this, uh, in this study. Exclusions. Uh, so the baseline sampling strategy did exclude um, those living in the three territories on federal First Nation reserves and other First Nation settlements, 
full-time members of the Canadian Armed Forces, those living in institutional, you know, 24-hour long-term care settings, um, those with uh, temporary visa or, or in transitional health coverage, uh, those with cognitive impairment, and those who are unable to respond in English or French. Okay, so um, in terms of the analysis that was used to um, come up with these findings, we we use multivariable logistic ordinal or multinomial regression models. Uh, and so what I'm showing you today is we're analyzing independent um, variables from baseline to predict, um, you know, the potential of elder abuse or elder abuse severity at three year follow up. And so this does, you know, go sort of above and beyond um, what is mostly out there in terms of sort of cross-sectional um, data at, at one time. Um, so that, that, you know, that was very exciting. Um, selection of the independent variables into the multivariable models was based on uh, their significance in the bivariate analyses, as well as tolerance and variance inflation factor diagnostics. Um, and then all models, regardless of, of you know, those unadjusted uh, bivariate uh, levels of significance, all models did control for, at minimum, um, sex, race, culture, and age as basic uh, socio-demographics, and whether or not the interview was conducted in person or over the telephone. Um, and then I conducted analysis for elder abuse as like as a whole, as a, as a global phenomenon, but then also separate analyses based on the separate subtypes that were covered in the CLSA. So uh, as a note, uh, the CLSA does include emotional abuse, physical abuse, and financial abuse. Uh, it did not include neglect or sexual abuse. And uh, having been a part of um, a couple of different population-based studies, it's it, it actually would be somewhat abnormal to have enough information on the issue of sexual abuse um, anyways. Okay, so here are some of the findings. Um, so the one-year prevalence. Um, so we found an overall one-year prevalence of elder abuse of 10%. Um, you can see the confidence intervals there is uh, fairly tight. Um, in this data set, we see that emotional abuse comes out way ahead, um, you know, and then followed by financial abuse and physical abuse. Um, you know, and that that is is somewhat, I would say, um, in 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 some other studies, we would find uh, I would say higher rates of financial abuse uh, relative to emotional abuse, uh, but certainly that physical abuse rate is is very consistent. Um, so you know this is uh, a fairly large rate. I mean, this is telling us that about one out of every ten older adults who live in Canada uh, experience some form of elder mistreatment um, each year. Um, and so we now have a couple of population-based studies uh, to, to base our prevalence um, estimates on um, that, that range from 8.2 to 10%. Um, uh, we conducted a, you know, a, 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 a systematic review a few years ago to look at the global prevalence of elder abuse. We found that in North America, it was about 9.5% after pooling the data across population-based studies. So the, the, the rate that that was found here um, is very consistent and you know a lot of people would argue that at this point we don't we don't need to do more prevalence studies we 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 know we we're, we're pretty sure that it's about 10 percent um and um you know that obviously translate to translates to a lot of older adults uh, here in canada about nine hundred seventy thousand people who are ages 60 years or older um you know it's hard to know which direction that this estimate may be biased. Um, most studies do not include particularly vulnerable subpopulations of older adults. So for example, older adults with cognitive impairment, older adults who live in institutional settings. Um, we also know that older adults tend to under-report personal problems. So these are all reasons that the, you know this 10% est this estimate may actually be an underestimate. Having said that, um, you know, um, it, uh, it's also possible that, that some of these uh, 
questions are are are, are overly sensitive um, and and may capture cases that aren't necessarily uh, abuse, but may, may represent more kind of routine family conflict. Um, so it's it's difficult to say, but but I mean it is fairly consistent this ten percent uh, prevalence rate. And then again, um, without effective prevention strategies in in place. Um, there's no reason to think this is going to change. Um, and so the scope is just, is gonna keep going up and up. Okay, so in terms of the findings as it relates to risk and protective factors, um, again, I, I would ask you to, to refer to the, to the final report when it does get posted, um, which will provide a lot more details. Um, you know, there were a lot of findings. I had to kind of decide how to present them here, but essentially I'm, I'm showing you those factors um, that were the most consistent across subtypes, either in relation to the global phenomenon of elder abuse or in relation to each subtype. So these are the ones that that were associated with at least two or more of the sub of these types. Um, and you can see that these risk and pro protective factors span several domains. So the ones that are highlighted in, or written in red are, are risk factors, and the one in green are protective factors. So. From a physical uh, health perspective, the number of chronic diagnosed chronic health conditions as, as that goes up, um, an older adult is at higher risk. Similarly, as an, uh, is the number of uh, functional impairments that an adult, an old adult is living with goes up, so does their risk of other mistreatment. Uh, staying with risk factors, um, um, as the, uh, you know, so mental, it's not just physical health, but mental health came out as a very strong and consistent um, domain. So people living with higher um, numbers of depressive sy symptoms were at higher risk. People living with higher numbers of PTSD symptoms were at higher risk. Um, one of the things that was really, really interesting um, is historically uh, people who reported having experienced sort of more severe levels of child maltreatment uh, at an early age, were were much more likely to experience elder abuse in their older adulthood, um, and this is something that I think is really fascinating from a life course perspective. Um, the home environment, as you have more people living in the house, the risk goes up, um, and then um, having inadequate income to meet uh, basic needs also increases risk. In terms of protective factors, uh, one of the strongest and most consistent was life satisfaction. So older adults who were who were reporting higher levels of life satisfaction were less likely to be victims of elder mistreatment. Um, those reporting higher levels of total social support, um, you know, uh, were less likely, and so so social support came out as a very consistent uh, protective factor. And you know, we can certainly discuss some of these as you know later on. Um, I would say surprisingly, um, uh, females came out as less li likely to experience elder mistreatment. Uh, although at a descriptive level, there were certainly more female victims. Proportionally, um, they were not more likely. Uh, and then lower education, um, uh, people with lower education were less likely to report elder, elder abuse. Um, one that I want to just, I, you know, highlight just because, you know, this finding um, also that, that came out of this, so Black identifying older adults as being at heightened risk of financial abuse. Um, this is a finding that has now been replicated across five population-based studies here in Canada and in the U.S. And, um, you know, it's, let's five, you know, five population-based, that's the best data we have. Um so this is something that I think, um, you know, it's arguably it's one of the, if not the most kind of consistent risk factor, uh, at least for financial abuse, uh, and something that we need to be, you know, think about a lot more and 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 uh, try to understand further. Um, this doesn't come from the CLSA, but I just, in the spirit of that kind of ecological framework, these are sort of what are understood as being strong risk factors that are attached to the trusted other. In other words. You know, adult children out there, spouses, grandchildren, friends, neighbors, etc., who may be in a position of mistreating an older adult. Uh, so those living with higher levels of caregiver stress, mental illness, substance use issues, dependency upon the older adult, um, and those who have been abused by the older adult as a child, uh, they're at higher risk of 
perpetrating abuse. Um, and so just sort of shifting here. So up until this point in the presentation, I've been talking about the issue of elder abuse in sort of dichotomous uh, terms. Um, so it's I, I've been sort of discussing this issue as something that either occurs or it doesn't. And this is obviously, this is necessary when we're thinking about, when we're trying to understand the, a, a prevalence rate or risk factors uh, among older adults in, general, in the general population. Um, the problem with this dichotomous kind of operational view of the issue is that it does kind of obscure and hide the wide variation of sort of lived mistreatment experiences that do occur within that yes category. Um, and so one of the things that the field is doing in the last sort of, I would say, five years in particular is to, is to try to understand this issue through more of a spectrum of severity. Uh, not just putting everybody in the same kind of one category of yes. Uh, and there's different ways that severity has been looked at uh, to, to date. So, you, you know, uh, we've done some work where we're looking at the subjective appraisal of the issue from the perspective of the, of the older adult themselves. And then there's work that's been done on, and what I'm going to show you today is more the frequency of mistreated behaviors, uh, the multiplicity of behaviors, meaning that Within any given subtype, let's say emotional abuse, there may be eight different types of emotional abuse. So how many of those different behaviors were experienced? Uh, and then the multiplicity of actual mistreatment types. So was the person experiencing emotional abuse? Were they also experiencing physical abuse, financial abuse? In other words, that's another way to kind of start construct constructing our understanding of, of severity. And there are all other sorts of ways to understand severity uh, out there as well. So what we have found is that when we do look at severity, um, there is a, you know, a dosage response with, with adverse uh, outcomes. Um, it also comports more closely with the way that we look at cases in the community when we are addressing them. And so um, it's actually um, uncommon that the goal is to take a case from a yes, you know, like a purely yes status to a purely no status. And the reason for that is because unlike, for example, child maltreatment, um, when we're working with these cases, older adult, adults have the right to self-determination and, and autonomy. They get to choose what their sort of resolution looks like. And it's very rare that they would kind of want to pursue some path of intervention that would actually lead to a complete, you know, no. I, you know, like there's no more risk because what that would mean is that it would mean severing their relationship with their perpetrator, who's often a, you know, a child, grandchild, or it would mean moving, out, you know, out of the home. So that's obvious. So as we're often following more of a harm reduction model. And so some kind of severity lens or spectrum lens is, is more uh, realistic. Um, and with that in mind, if we can understand risk factor severity for severity, then we, we can start sort of understanding which interventions um, can sort of target those factors that either increase or ameliorate severity. Okay, so for, with all that in mind, um, okay, and also from a measurement perspective, it, it just creates opportunity for more sensitive measurement over the course of intervention. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much more time on this. Okay, so, we were able to look at this uh, to a certain degree with the CLSA data, which was which was great. Um, and so the research question here was what what factors were associated with elder abuse severity among victims over the three year period? Um, and so in this analysis, we were only looking at the subset or the subsample of older adults who had been classified as victims based on the prevalence work that I showed you before. So it's not the full CLSA sample, but rather among those victims there's a variation in severity, what factors predict that variation in severity? And so the way we define severity in, in this particular analysis was based on frequency and multiplicity. So um, it ranged anywhere from, you know, this person experienced one sort of behavioral um, form of emotional abuse in the past year to, you know, they, they experienced that one behavioral form several times in the past year to, you know, they experienced several forms of emotional abuse in the past year. 
And then on the other end, multiple forms of that abuse multiple times over the past year. So here, here are the, the factors. Um, so again, you know, looking at similar domains, um, we see that now self-reported health was actually the, the main kind of physical health indicator as opposed to the number of uh, diagnosed chronic health conditions or number of functional impairments. Um, mental health, the, the PTSD symptoms came out as, as important when we're looking at severity. Um, by far, the most consistent and kind of also uh, in magnitude risk factor for severity, you know, across types, all types, was whether or not the person lived with a perpetrator. Um, now, this makes sense. I think this is intuitive. If you live with your perpetrator, you're at much higher uh, risk of more severe forms of mistreatment. And so this obviously has really important implications for the way we intervene on the problem. Uh, interestingly, uh, when we look at social determinants, um, well, when we're looking at prevalence, females were at lower risk. Now that we're looking at severity, it comes female um, identifying older adults are at higher risk of more severe forms of mistreatment. Um, and then again, this issue of child maltreatment, uh, very consistent. Um, and and I, I just, you know, I think it's really interesting moving forward. So people who experience child maltreatment in their early life, more likely to experience more severe forms of elder mistreatment later in life. Um, so what are some of the um, kind of key messages here. So one is that it, it was it was very exciting to uh, to get into a more longitudinal design to look at these risk and protective factors over time. Um, again, one in 10 older adults uh, experiencing elder abuse within a given year. Um, you know what, which is a big, you know, that's a, obviously that's a big rate. Um, and, and, and um, um, you know, I, I think reinforce and, and, and replicates uh, prior findings as well. Uh, as it relates to physical health status, um, you know, healthcare providers um, are are in a position to play a very important role here, uh, particularly as it relates to identifying and screening older adults who are at risk of elder abuse. And so, um, you know, many of you out in the audience today may be healthcare providers. And if you do work with older adults on a routine basis, what this is telling us is that you probably fairly often uh, do come across an older adult who's either experiencing elder abuse or is at higher risk given the one in 10 uh, finding. But it's not just physical health. I mean, those of you out there who are working in the domains around mental health, I mean, this is also a very important uh, domain of risk um, predicting elder abuse. And, and so, understanding and helping people with that as well. Uh, and then as I've said before, I think that this link with child maltreatment, it does carry important implications across research and practice. So um, the implication here is that we, we you know, we really um, shouldn't kind of keep looking at these, we need to look at these issues of family violence from a life course perspective rather than conceptualizing them as dis discrete life stages. So so often, you know, like we, we kind of silo ourselves. There's child maltreatment researchers and practitioners. There's people who work on domestic violence and intimate partner violence. And there's those of us who work on elder abuse. But really, you know, these things are connected. I mean, in other studies, there's also connections between domestic and intimate partner violence with elder abuse. So the way we practice with victims um, needs to take these things into account. Uh, social support, social connectedness, hugely important protective factor, uh, and just the yeah the reality that these factors do span across several domains. Um, and then I, I I mentioned before that you know in addition to looking at prevalence, it is very important to understand incidence. So um, you know the rate of you know people experiencing this issue for the first time over a given period of time, um, and um, if that is something that you're you're interested in, um, this was a pop a population based longitudinal uh, elder abuse study that that looked at uh, ten year incidents and uh, factors associated with um, that incidence. And I believe that's that's it. Um, I I will leave it there. And if you have any questions, please feel free to um, 
ask them in the chat or a couple were already answered in the uh in the q a um there was one i don't know if you want to touch on it again but i think a couple participants um noted the the lower education and being a protective factor and i think you already did mention that this had to do with uh um uh, more of the responses uh bias than anything else anything else to add on that no i i would agree with that i i think that's right there's a reporting bias going on there um that's also really consistent like any study that population made study that i've been you know like just out there it's it's uh that's often the case and i think that there is a reporting bias that people who are more educated are perhaps more likely to uh be sort of aware of, of and, and more willing to report on the issue mm -hmm. yeah i agree okay um and then i think the next question um it's longer but has the study considered investment advisors or financial advisors that convince elders to invest money and they get paid a fee and the elder lo adult loses money by trusting the advisors with their expertise and knowledge losing money later in life after having worked a lifetime is very upsetting it impacts the years that they have left so i guess anything related to that in your research well i i, I think that you know so i, I appreciate that that comment um and it's it is a really serious issue it does happen um you know i've personally been involved in cases um involving uh financial uh advisors and investors um who did take advantage of older adults um and um i think that you know that certainly the findings again if you look at the report when it comes out specific to find you know there, there's findings that are specific to financial abuse uh those risk and protective factors would apply um to um you know those types of relationships with financial advisors as well so you know so financial advisors would be viewed as somebody who is in a relationship of trust mm -hmm. um and um so I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, those findings would be certainly applicable to those older adults who may be more vulnerable to that type of mistreatment, for sure. Great. Um, and I guess the idea of of uh, the maltreatment or abuse happening in childhood and then later in life, um, question is, you know, is it is it that it happens across the lifespan or is it, you know, within these these different parts of life? Anything on that? So, you know, it's a really good question. I, I don't know the answer. And I think that's a whole like line of inquiry out there is, you know, like, what is it that connects these things? Because they are, they do, they do seem to predict one another. Um, you know, um, so is it sort of from a psycho emotional perspective that if you experience child maltreatment, that kind of sets up your kind of perceptions of self and kind of expectations for self and the types of relationships perhaps that you are familiar with and deserve um and you're more likely to enter those kinds of relationships or have those kinds of relationships in your life moving forward um you know that's one sort of possibility and another may be that we know that child maltreatment is associated with for example mental health outcomes that are in turn risk factors for elder abuse so there may be sort of a mediating um kind of pathway that goes on there um you know but i i don't know i mean that's that's a really important question okay. uh, next question is about the the link to mental health or the predictor of mental health as a key predictor of of elder abuse has have you looked at the association between mental health and elder abuse from the perspective of poor mental health as an outcome for abuse of abuse yes yes so so poor mental health has been found to be an outcome as well yep okay great so we will move on um and that now there's two questions from from cliff uh first question is do you have any plans to stratify these models by race or ethnicity to explore differences in risk factors for severity and prevalence across identities um, and then the second question is, will you be replicating these analyses with CLSA's Indigenous cohort? Um, so, yes, uh, yes, I do have plans to to um, to look within specific subgroups um, uh, 
Um, uh, I mentioned the this finding that Black identifying older adults as being at higher risk for financial abuse. So looking, for example, within the subsample of Black identifying older adults to try to understand like what, what's going on within this sample that, that places people at risk. Um, and um, I appreciate you mentioning the Indigenous um, uh, sample. I, I, I'm, I, I admittedly, I, I'm actually not aware uh, of it too much, but that sounds... Yeah incredibly uh important and uh I'm, I'm going to look into that thank you yeah so just to clarify the clsa does not have a indigenous uh cohort um we do okay. uh, one of the questions at baseline is um a participants can self-identify um and we have developed um we have been working on our um data access and policies and procedures around use of the data uh, that relates to um identify identif those participants that identify as uh, as indigenous so um, and more information about that can be on our website so yeah just to clarify that um, okay so we will move on then uh, to the next question they're uh, they're coming in uh, fast now um, I'm assuming that you use pooled data from both tracking and comprehensive um, is that right and if it is yes then I assume you use the pooled weights generated by CLSA Yes, uh, all of that is correct. Yes. Um, uh, so next question, are you aware of similar studies in the territory? So I presume similar studies of yours because the CLSA doesn't include um, uh, t the territories within the cohorts. Have there been similar work that include those participants? Uh, people? I am not aware of, of that. Um, hmm. You know, but but it's something I would be interested in in uh, being a part of. Um, you know, um, I, you know, I, I, obviously, one of the exclusions here were, were um, people living um, in the in the territories, and uh, so so I think that uh, you know, like that, that would be really important to uh, to pursue. Lots of opportunities. Um, okay, so next question is, can we go back to the fact that being female is a preventative preventive factor overall? Um, and it's surprising to me, given the rates of gender-based violence overall, um, just having a hard time wrapping my head around it. So any comments about that? Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, it was a surprising finding. Um, you know, so globally, um, we find that 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 females are at higher risk. Um, but you know, interestingly, when you look at the studies that have been conducted in North America, uh, it's inconclusive. I mean, you know, this actually isn't the only study that has found uh, females as being a protective factor. Uh, there are also a couple of studies of, who have found female identifying older adults as a risk factor, and then there's studies that don't have any finding either way. So, um, you know, it's, uh, I, you know, I, I agree with you. It's surprising, um, given gender-based violence dynamics and, and, and certainly, um, you know, I, I think the severity findings there that found that, that females were at higher risk of more severe forms of mistreatment, um, you know, are indicative of the power relations that are in, involved in, in, you know, the, the dynamics of, of the victim perpetrator relationship and that, um, but, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, it, it, it's a tough one, uh, you know, for me as well. I, I, uh, uh, you know the vulner the age associated vulnerabilities. I, I don't know if that somehow has, has some kind of a, uh, an effect on these things but it's a good question um and i guess uh are you aware of any agencies in canada that focus specifically on protecting older adults from abuse that you may have worked with or want to work yeah with? so i mean i um so in terms of um yeah i i across canada i, I can't speak too much um so in in new brunswick uh, there is an adult protective services program similar to what you find in, in every state in the U.S. Um, 
Here in Ontario, we, we actually just started a program called RISE. This is based on years of research and kind of evaluation, but it's, it's you know, so we, we have developed a community-based elder mistreatment response program that we work in partnership with Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario um, and uh, um, work with and respond, to, you know, to cases involving older adults who are at risk of or experiencing mistreatment. Um, so a, a couple of examples um, here in Canada. Yeah, and um, there's also a, a one of our one of our participants also noted the Canadian Network for Prevention of Elder Abuse is another would be another uh, resource. Yeah, I, 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 no, so so CNPA at full yeah. transparency, I'm I am on their uh, their board, <laughs> um, and so that's a fantastic uh, organization, Canadian organization. Um, uh, you know, we don't do direct practice work with older adults, uh, but certainly hugely important organization in terms of education, advocacy, okay. uh, and all sorts of. Great. Um, okay, well, we have a few minutes left and a few more questions to get through, so I'll try to push through them. Um, if frequency is available, did you consider using response cut points to estimate the incidence of elder abuse? Um, so, yes. Uh, if I'm understanding the question correctly. Okay, so for financial abuse and physical abuse, um, we did not use threshold cut points. In other words, if somebody reported one incident of, you know, financial abuse or one event of physical abuse, that was viewed as enough of a threshold to classify them as a victim. However, with emotional abuse, um, we only, for, for most of the items, we only counted them as a victim um, if they identified the frequency as, hap as having happened most of the, I think it was something like most of the time. But in other words, if somebody said that they were yelled at, but it only occurred once or twice, they weren't viewed as a victim of elder abuse. But if it's something that happened more often than they were. And that kind of threshold is, is consistent with uh, more recent research. Great. Um, and the next question is uh, two questions in one. Uh, do we have a sense of relative elder abuse prevalence across the provinces in Canada? Um, and then does any literature out there look at the impact of elder abuse on driving older adults out of their home towards hospitalization or assisted living, et cetera? Right. Uh, I, I mean, the CLSA data could be used to look at province by province um, uh, rates. Um, I, I think that's something that could uh, easily be done. Um, I didn't do that, but I, that could be done. Um, and then for the second question, yeah, I mean, what we, you know, like the, the research has found that older victims of elder abuse do have higher rates of hospitalization and placement in uh, alternative care, you know, long-term care settings. Um, and the next question from Pam, I think it's more of a, a suggestion to delve into relationship history within the CLSA, and that's something that I can uh, definitely take forward, or David, you could as well as a as a research for um, CLSA. Um, so I think we'll go on to... So is, is that suggestion, is the suggestion that there are variables that, that I could use, or is, this, is the suggestion that we, that's something that the CLSA can think about as adding new variables that's a good question i took it as the clsa adding other variables to look okay. at that um that being said that i think you could probably look at what's already being collected and make some um you know look at different types of relationships yeah. as they change right as we as the clsa um has more waves of data collection that could probably be be done but uh, good point. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, okay, so we'll go on to social support. Could you elaborate on social support, um, how that was measured in the study, and if you have any suggestions on how government policy or programs could support older adults with that aspect? It's a big question. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. So, so the CLSA um, actually has a lot of different indicators of, of social support, um, um, and. You know, the, the finding that I showed you here today was kind of like uh, like a total measure of social support um, that includes 
different forms so tangible so social support I, I think emotional so social support and, and a, a couple of others um I think the you know um what one of the things that that kind of comes out when you get into the details of the report is that it's not necessarily the the quantity or the the like the absolute size of one's network but rather uh it's it's also the quality of relationships uh in their life and um I, you know i i think there's a lot of policy implications here i mean you know there's there's things like you know friendly visitor programs or you know volunteer phone calls to older adults um you know certainly in the work that that we do with the rise program a, a big part of it is, is to try to strengthen the social supports around around older adults um i think there's a lot of creative ways that you can introduce or strengthen social quality social support in, in the lives of older adults um so that's i think that's an important uh important question uh and we are perhaps we'll leave it with uh the last comment we have here which i'll just relay and then we can wrap up uh comment from Sarah, uh, given the relational component of elder abuse, I think it would be insightful to explore 2S LGBTQI plus older adult experiences. Um, these adults are more likely to rely on informal caregivers, and these caregivers are more likely to be chosen uh, family rather than biological uh, family. They are also more likely to have distrust in their doctor and not to close, disclose sexual orientation or go back into the closet to receive care. Um, I think overall, this is a something else that definitely could be looked at in the future. Yeah, it's it's hugely important. I appreciate the comment. Um, we actually did look at it to the extent that we were able to in this. Uh, and, and again, if you look at the report, there are some more detailed findings uh, around um, different identifying social identities. Um, in this case, they, they may not have been related to two or more types, and that's why I didn't put them in the slides here today, but but there were, are some kind of nuanced findings um, that, you, that you can take a look at. Great. Well, thank you again to our presenter today. We definitely appreciate your participation, um, and thank you to all of our participants in the webinar as well for your um interest and also for participating and submitting questions. I'd like to remind everyone that the next deadline for data access applications is January 17th of 2024. Uh, please visit the CLSA website under data access to review what data is available, as well as additional details about the application process. I'd also like to remind everyone to complete their anonymous survey upon exiting the session today. Um, and um, yeah, the next CLSA webinar is going to be entitled Examination of the Increased Risk for Falls Among Individuals with Knee Osteoarthritis. Um, it will be presented on November 30th at 12 p.m. by Jessica uh, Wilfong of the Schroeder Arthritis Institute, which is based at the University Health Network in Toronto. Uh, registration details are available um, on the CLSA website, um, and they've also been posted in the chat box. Uh, and finally, remember that CLSA promotes the webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar. And we, of course, invite you to follow us on Twitter at, at CLSA underscore ELCV. So again, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, have a wonderful rest of the day.